Hi, welcome to the B&H event space. I'm Jack Rosnicki and- I'm Ed Greenberg. Ed Greenberg here, and we're the Copyright Zone. We're gonna be doing questions and answers on copyright and legal issues and a whole bunch of stuff that's been coming up. Um, we're doing this once again, uh, just to prove that the security at B&H is not what it used to be, so we both got in. And we have to explain that there has been an enormous storm in the New York area, and there are just a few brave souls who have uh, uh, been able to get here, so we're a little sparse today. Uh, some of the trains were closed uh, and shut down, so uh, thank you, uh, people, for braving the weather. And uh, we're not going to go over a lot of other stuff, basic stuff that we've gone over several times. You can go and see some of the other uh, um, webinars we've done here at b &H to go over them, things like um, copyright registration. Uh, the only thing I will say is, and we will be repeating this over and over again, you can't file a lawsuit for copyright infringement without a um, registration, copyright registration from the Copyright Office. And we'll be going over that, uh, I think, in detail. What we're gonna be doing, um, let me just do the, paper, the uh, house cleaning stuff first. Um, this is, of course, me and Ed, our logo. We talk until we're blue in the face because we seem to be going over the same stuff over and over again for photographers. Um, and it's a lot of the basic stuff about copyright and legal issues. And we talk until we're blue in the face. Uh, you can follow us on our blog, thecopyrightzone.com. Uh, we have some interesting articles on a lot of different issues. In fact, we're finding out there's some, some IP law firms that follow us uh, on this. Because I think we bring up issues uh, from a different perspective in a different way. Uh, to remind people, I'm a commercial photographer. Ed is an IP litigator, and he litigates uh, a lot of these issues in court in front of judges. Uh, we do have a very good textbook out called The Copyright Zone. It's used in a lot of colleges as course text uh, for a lot of these issues. Uh, we will be updating it because of the changes in copyright registration, which we're going to be going over. And the book is not only about copyright, it has to do with model releases, if you're a wedding photographer, issues that come up for wedding photographers, assignment photographers, and uh, other issues that have nothing to do with copyright. Uh, and if you need to get a hold of us, this is the house cleaning. This is this is Ed, a handsome photo of you, taken by a talented photographer. <laughs> um, Ed's email is ecglaw at gmail.com or visit his website, greenbergiplaw.com, um, and he will try and get back to you. If you need to get a hold of me, uh, I'm jack at photonews.net or resnicki.com if you want to visit my website, and you can contact me through that also. Don't let the fact that he's holding a camera confuse you. Canon camera. <laughs> Explorer of light. So um, we're going to. this session is mostly about questions and answers. We're going to answer uh, whatever questions. If you have questions, uh, please go on the um, event space Twitter feed and post them, and we'll be uh, answering them. Uh, but first, we have a couple other issues that we want to go over. Uh, the first ones are the new rules and new procedures in copyright registration. As of February 20th, the Copyright Office has changed uh, a bunch of things on registration. And I think it's vital that you know what these changes are. February 2018. and. The Something question was when, was, when was this changed? It was February 20th, 2018. They can't hear questions from the audience. All right. We're, we're going to get to some of the search firms and about copyright registration a little bit later. But anybody who's giving you the registration requirements from 2015, 2009, they're out the window. They have no application. And right don't now, wander too far that way. You're out of camera. Stay a little. There you go. And your good side's the other side, so it doesn't know. So first, we're going to go. We're also going to do some myth busting after we do uh, that. But let's jump right into the registration. This is the front page of the um, Electronic Copyright Office, also known as ECHO, small e, capital C O, um, and you get there by going to copyright.gov. 
notcopyright.com, which is a commercial site, copyright.gov, uh, and you just follow it to register copyright, and it'll lead you to the uh, electronic copyright office. And this is such an easy process that I teach my clients' nine-year-old children to do it. So there is no reason with very, very rare exception that you should pay anybody, including a lawyer or a service or anybody, to register your images. This is about as difficult as getting a card uh, from a gambling casino for uh, that's to play harder. the slot machines. That's yes, harder. that's harder. That um, is harder. You have to show proof of ID. That's right. Um, <laughs> so we've gone over this step by step by step in other um, webinars and also it, it, when we do Kelby is on there and in our book and other places, but we're going to go over the new changes. The new changes are basically here on the left side. There's a lot more options, but generally what photographers are going to deal with is this uh, click right here that says register a group of photographs. Um, odds are you're going to want to register a group of photographs rather than an individual photograph. An individual photograph costs $35. A group up to 750 is $55. It used to be virtually um, not unlimited, but I could register 13, 14,000. We did a seminar at the Hallmark School of Photography, and Jack registered 12,000 images on stage in about nine minutes, which was great well, was for photographers and great for attorneys because my advice and Jack's advice is going to be you register everything all the time, no matter what because you don't know whether an image is going to be valuable. Now, the government has reduced that, that ceiling from many thousands to 750. But as Jack is going to get into, the group of images does not have to be of the same thing. Right. And uh, the 750 is because nobody in the government has ever heard of a motor drive or somebody shooting a wedding or it is me, I'm going on a vacation. I'm shooting a lot more than 750 images. I think in our last webinar we did here, we showed exactly how much it would cost me to register um, the many thousands that I've registered in the past for $55. Now to register that, I think it was something like $900 to register the group that I had. So now I have to carefully edit what I'm registering, which I'm not happy about. It slows me up. It's, it's one more impediment to getting everything registered. The, the other thing is that if you're an assignment shooter, one of my clients does makeup and high fashion and she cranks out thousands of images in two three days this is a big uh, cost for her which she of course passes on to the client already um, when you click on this register a group of photographs you'll be taken to this page uh, which is basically your eligibility cr criteria which is just that this is for a group of published photographs or a group of unpublished photographs. You can't mix the two. And to complete it, there's always three requirements. You have to provide, you have to finish the application form, which is what we're going over. You have to pay the required fee, which should be $55 for a group. And you can upload, um, you can mail in your the images you're registering, but we highly suggest to just upload it. It's very quick and easy to do that. And we're going to say this probably four times today, and there will be people out there who will still screw it up. It's not $55 per image. It's $55 for up to 750. If you send in 50 images, it's $55. If you send in 500, it's $55. I have a question. There's a quick question in the audience. Go ahead. Um, what's the difference between published and non-published and unpublished photographs? What's the difference between published and unpublished I, photographs I is the question. Obviously, but is, is there a definition that, that they use? That's a um, there, there is something known as the copyright compendium where they try and explain it as to the criteria that they use. To say it's confusing is, is uh, putting it mildly. Uh, technically, Ed and I are a little bit different on what he's very conservative on it. I'm, I'm a lot looser and I'm interpreting the requirements differently. Uh, technically, it's anything presented to the public 
is considered a publication. Anything presented to the public for further distribution or sale. So if you have things on that you're just displaying, technically that's not a publication. If you have a button or something on your website that offers the images for sale, that's considered a publication. Um, so it, it's there's a lot of different gray areas in it, uh, in that. And we're going to go over a little bit more. Uh, we're going to do something really quick on watermarks. And um, I think that's a better place to address this a little more deeply. Let me just tick off the easy ones that are published and the easy ones that aren't published. The easy ones, because there are some areas that are gray. If your photograph is on a Clairol box, if it's in an ad in Time Magazine, if it is in a poster in a Walmart, it's published. If it's accompanying an article about something in a magazine or on a website, it's published. If anybody and everybody can see it, it's on a billboard, it's published. In my view, as an attorney, I take the safer route, which is if anybody can see it, it's published with these exceptions. You've never taken it theoretically out of the drawer. You've never shown it to anyone except in an advertising situation, and you show three or four people in a private meeting three or four shots that you have in front of the ad agency that's working on the Chevy account, and you're not showing it to anybody else, and they pick one, those are not published because they can be password protected or you're showing a small group of people who can't then show them to anybody else. Then there's the gray area, which we'll get to later. But you're better off, if you're in doubt, assuming that they're published and then ask your lawyer if there's an issue. So let's say you have a website or a blog. I'm going to have to repeat whatever you say, so oh, yeah. there'll be a little delay. There's a question from the right. audience. Okay. Let's say you have a website or just a blog. You have a website or a blog. Uh, you upload a couple things. Let's say for more photos, click here. Would that be published? It, and, and all it is is your website saying, um, if you want to see more photos, click here. Uh, no, I mean, if, if it's just for display purposes, it's not considered published. If you're saying, if you want to see more pictures, you're, you're not saying these pictures are for sale. But if you imply anywhere that these pictures are available for sale or licensing or, or, licensing or further distribution, then you've crossed uh, that line and it may now be considered published. Now, Jack and I disagree because from an attorney standpoint, I play it differently. Because I've had other attorneys say, and take the position and have judges take the position that it's published. If anybody can see it, it's published. If I can go to your website intentionally or by mistake and see that picture, a judge, many judges have considered that published. There's all kinds of legal case law and I can get into the weeds of it, okay? But each situation, each fact pattern is different. There is no one size fits all answer. Jack is right as to what the copyright rules say, but the rules are not always, um, they don't always uh, apply to every single situation because there are so many unique situations that I could go literally for weeks telling you about different situations. The display situation with ad agencies is something that I have successfully sued for copyright infringement. If it's passed around by an ad agency and say, which one should we use? Should we use Jack's picture or should we use Sally's picture as a theme for the new Chevy campaign? That to me is publication and I've been successful on that. Eh. Yeah, <laughs> right, sometimes it's not. Uh, there's another question, and then we're, we're going to continue. Is it Facebook or Instagram? Is it Facebook or Instagram? Uh, it, it, to me, it depends. How many followers do you have? If you, if you have, like, you know, 700 followers, 600, that's considered a pretty small group on the Internet these days. If you have 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 followers, that could be considered a publication, in, in my view. You Ed should, would be different. You should not assume, because I've done this in real life in front of flesh and blood uh, lawyers and judges, you should not assume 
just as an observer, that if you see an image on Instagram or, face, or Facebook um, that it's put there by an individual, there are companies that place those images. So I've had cases against record companies, movie companies, uh, media companies of all, of all kinds who pay third party companies to paste, uh, to place, paste, place, photographs of, let's say, an album cover or of a particular rock star and say, oh, his but, new album is great. That's not the Th question. Then. Those companies who are pasting on Facebook have names like Sally B. And they're actually ads. That, but that's not his question. His question is, is he uploading something on Facebook or Instagram? I understand is, that. Does that constitute publication? And I understand that. And because so many companies do it professionally, with the intent that others see it, another attorney would argue, you published it, just like these companies get paid lots of money by the record companies and the TV networks and the movie companies to paste, uh, to post uh, all these photographs of famous rock stars or movies. No different. You're advertising, no different. Uh, and I, I would argue differently. And, and it's gonna be up to a judge in some of those cases. So this is what makes this, um, frustrating and confusing for everybody. You want to make is, it easy though? Is is that I can't I can't say that Ed is wrong and and Ed can't say that I'm completely wrong on this issue. It's we would like to have a clear line uh, in the sand saying this is it. If you do this, it's this. If you do that, it's that. It's not though. The way the the copyright laws and the way they're being judged out there, there's a lot it falls under something known as it depends. But here's the good news. A clever person resolves a problem. Geniuses avoid the problem, okay? So be a genius. If you register the work like Jack is going to show you how, it doesn't matter. And we're going to talk it about water. It makes no difference. If someone steals it, you're, yeah. you're in the money. You're yeah. fine. Yeah, I, quite honestly, if you register all your work, you, you are matter. not worried about that small percentage that might um, uh, infringe on it, that might steal it. In fact, sometimes you're looking at is is a pretty nice payday, I hate to say, but that's the reality of what's out there. I have clients and, who have and, a St. Jude statue who they nightly ask that someone infringe upon their works. Um, but the point is a lot of people aren't putting things up because they're scared somebody's going to infringe or steal it. And, and what I keep saying is you're letting the tail wag the dog. That out of the, the 5,000 people that you want to see it, you're letting the one person that might steal it out of that group influence 5,000 not seeing it and maybe opening up a door for something else and you know th that's really good for you. That's the whole idea of putting things out on the internet is you want your work out there. Otherwise, just leave it in a drawer where nobody will see it. And after you die, maybe you know, you'll be the next um, um, uh, Vivian mayor, you know, yeah. who's very successful after she passes away. I mean, my feeling is I want my work out there, but I want my work protected, so I'm going to register the work. Let's continue on this, and, and some great questions, and do keep asking, but I do want to get further in this. So this is just, you know, telling you what's going on. You click Start Registration, which is up here. You click on that, and do not use the forward or back button on your browser. You have to use their forward or back buttons on these. So this is the first screen you'll come up that you have to fill out, and that's um, and you may not be able to read it, but you have to pick the type of group, and then everything with an asterisk you have to fill out on this whole thing. So you have to do this, you have to do this. There's a lot of things that are optional, you'll see. So um, you have to agree that you've read and understand everything, uh, all the requirements for a group. You click on that. The types of groups, you have a choice of two. And the two you have is either published or unpublished. You can't mix the two. If you click on unpublished, the next window that'll appear is this one. And it, it's just more information. And again, you just have to make sure that you've agreed that you've read it and you understand it. It's, it's pretty much the exact same thing as published. It'll say all the photos have to be um, unpublished. Uh, they were created by the same author, meaning the same photographer in our case, and are owned by the same copyright claimant. You're the copyright claimant, unless you've given the copyright to somebody else, which we don't recommend. Um, if you're doing published, and I'll show you in a minute, the only difference is it wants the date of publication. Now, 
Number two is it contains 750 or less. So you can't do more than, you can't do 751. It's 750 or less. This is the new thing, and it used to be just for published, and now it's for published and unpublished. A sequentially numbered list of photographs containing the title and file name for each photograph included in the group must be uploaded along with other required application materials. The list must be submitted in approved document format, such as um, uh, uh, AXL or PDF file names must uh, for the numbered list must contain the title of the group, the case number assigned to the application. Now this is important. Guidelines for the numbered list can be found in copyright.gov website at, and they give you a link here. I'm going to show you what that does. That'll make this requirement very easy for you but I'm gonna show you where that is. You have to fill this out and send it in with your registration. This is one of the new requirements. And what this means is that if you're shooting a wedding or if you're shooting an assignment shot, tabletop, or you just shot 200 landscape uh, out in the desert, the moment you can, before you hand them to the client or before you transmit them to the client, register them. Before you even give them to the client. Yeah, if for it's me, an it's assignment the, shoot, just register them. It's the cost of doing business if you're a commercial photographer. It's, it's just built into your overhead these And one days. quickie, forgive me. Let's say you took 250 pictures in the Vegas desert, 250 pictures on the Vegas Strip, and 150 pictures in L.A. Can you file them all at the same time? If you shot them all in the same year, yes. Doesn't have to be the same topic. No. And... By the way, the, the way I get about it, I'll show you in a minute. This is uh, the front page. I'll, we've gone over this in detail. When you register, this is all the pages that you go through to fill it out. They're very simple. Some of them you actually skip. Um, but every time you complete it, you'll get a little check mark. So you did type of group, so that's been checked off. Now we're going into titles. And this is the title page. Um, and again, you see there's a back button, continue button, save for later in case you want to stop and, and a phone rang and you want to get to this later. Save for later on all the pages will just keep you at that spot without uh, uh, um, erasing anything. So you're going to click here on new to create a new title for this collection. And this page will show up. Um, this is for unpublished. If you did published, it's the exact same page. This is title of the group, year of completion, number of photos. If you're doing published, this is what the screen would look like. It's the same thing, title of the group, number of photos, year of completion, but they also want the earliest publication date in the group and the latest publication date in the group. So if it's the same date for everything, it would be the same date in both boxes. If it's a group where one was January 10th, 2018, and the last one was April 30th, 2018, then you'd put in those two dates. They also want the nation of first publication. That's generally for us going to be the United States. But if it's published somewhere else, initially, you need to put where it was initially published. Now, can I just get to the title of the group? If this was a, an ad. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fill this out. Okay. Let, let me continue. So I'm gonna go back to this and filled out, because I'm always doing unpublished. Published is, it can be a whole other headache and thing. I'm trying to get it as unpublished because if I register my work as unpublished and then it gets published, I'm fully covered because I've registered it as unpublished. The fact that I'm licensing it later for publication means it's still covered. I don't have to re-register things. So there's an advantage to doing it as unpublished because Once it's and easier. Done. So, and what I do to name my groups is I put my last name, second quarter, uh, usually I have the year too, and then I put miscellaneous, or I might put, um, if it's Las Vegas, I might put LV in New York, would be LV underline NY underline Paris. Just simple little, little title to know what I have in the group. But generally, I do it by the quarter that I'm registering, saying these were the shots I did for this quarter. That's my collection of images. Ah. You can call it Fred. It doesn't really matter what the collection is called. You just need a unique name. From the attorney's point of view, it matters to us. And it may matter to you because making your attorney's job simple makes your case better. 
if it's an assignment shoot and you did it for Chevrolet, it should be entitled Chevrolet shoot. If these are photographs that you took in the desert, it should say spring 2018 desert shots. If they're all photographs of Merrill Streep, it should say Merrill Streep. Because it's easier to litigate and it's easier to demonstrate to a judge and another attorney that this image is included. If you have, and sometimes you're going to do this, spring 2018, and they're all photographs of birds, they may have been shot all over the world over a three-month period, you can't help it. But if it's one designated shoot, then keep some name that keeps it as that designated shoot so that the, it's right there on the registration so that most attorneys and most judges don't even look up the actual images on a small case. On a big case, they'll look it up. So I have the title, I have the year of completion, 2018. There's a drop down menu for the number of images and it'll drop down and it'll have everything from one to 750. Why they don't trust us to put in our own number, <laughs> I don't know, but they don't. So I go down, because if I'm gonna register, I'm gonna find 750. I'm gonna use each and every spot I can. I wanna maximize what I get for my $55. So um, you'll go back again. Now, this is the interesting part that they don't tell you. Mm -hmm. And this is the part that can drive you a little nuts. Um, at this point, I would just hit continue and continue. What they sort of want you to do, but they don't tell you, and it's not necessary, and I'm gonna recommend you don't do it, is you click on new again after you've titled everything and did all of this, because there's another window that comes up. And this is the window that comes up. And they want you to put in how many photos you are entering, and they want the title of each image. And you're gonna get that from the template that you're gonna go to the link that I showed you earlier. But let me explain this. Here's the problem. Photograph titles, 1,995 character limit. <coughs> can't do that, guys. And, and from the audience, you can't do it if you got 750 images. That's right, because you got to put a comma between each one. So if you got 750, that's 750 commas. And what are you going to name your pictures? One, two? I mean, it's you can't get titles Can this way. I see you on Jeopardy. <laughs> so, so here's the 1,995 characters. We're trying to get an explanation of this. Um, I had a question in and a senior register was supposed to get back to me and they didn't on, can I write in here, if it's the same title, like Paris 01, Paris 02, can I put Paris 01 dash Paris 200? Inclusive. Inclusive. They. They have not gotten back to me. I will tell you, my guess is they don't know. You have federal government at work. Um, now, this is from the template, um, this wording, but I brought it into here to show you. It says, important, the Copyright Office strongly encourages you to provide the title of each photograph in the application itself. Now, I've, I've read a lot of stuff from the government, and when they say strongly encourage, it also means not required. So I wouldn't do this. The only time I would do this is if I had a small number of pictures. If I had, like let's say, an event happened in New York, it was a historic event, and I took 20 pictures. If that was the case, I would then make sure that I would put those 20 titles because it helps strengthen the fact that each image is by itself. Think of crime It's photos. a technical thing. Think of famous crime photos, assassination photos, and newsworthy type dramatic events where you're going to file those images as soon as you get home. If you walk out here and in the street, heaven forbid, some politician is murdered and you have shots of that right away, you are gonna register those, let's say it's only three shots, within 10 seconds before 
we start the auction with the news media. But you're going to auction those, and before you do, you're going to describe each of those three shots. And if you read our book or our column, you'll see that I've had many of those cases which involve Britney Spears' photo. There's a single photo of Britney Spears when she was 13 years old at a wedding where she was a guest. That's the subject of a single registration, that one shot. Because when Britney Spears became Britney Spears, the photographer, who was a big fan of ours for a long time, registered that shot. And collected on it many times. So um, this strongly encouraged you. Also, I, I did a photograph um, uh, with the newscaster. I can't remember her name all of a sudden. Um, with the globe. And we had a big ball uh, that we used. And they said, oh, we'll just superimpose curry. a globe. And curry. And curry. Um, and there was, we did it with an exercise ball. And they said, oh, I'll just take a picture of, they said, we'll get a globe and we'll just strip it in. I said, well, you can't get a globe because that's all um, um, copyrighted and trademarked by Macmillan and all the uh, map makers. But you can go on the NASA site and pull down an image from there because that's public domain. Because that's done for the government, we own the pictures. We can use those pictures. And they provide high-res images. They encourage or suggest that you put a credit line. It's not required. And NASA now is going, there's a word in NASA they want to start charging for the photographs because they want the money and they're being made to look bad by a lot of the private um, space companies and NASA needs to raise money so they're talking about licensing the images in the future. So far it's gone nowhere but NASA wants the money. It's like uh, Dorothea Lange's famous photograph of the migrant mother that was done for the WPA. That's public domain. You can go to the copyright office, go into the archives, download a high-res version of the negative or the print and sell it reuse it, use it in advertising, which it is used a lot, and it's absolutely fine because it's a public domain image. And you can also pay a stock agency to get it. That's right. They so will charge you. Stock agencies make a lot of money by licensing, they're not selling, they're licensing an image to you that's in the public domain. Their explanation is they're saving you time and aggravation. So they're selling something or licensing something to you which you can get for free. They're counting on your ignorance. Basically, any government image or government site is... The, the, the question is, is every government image or site public domain? Not necessarily. It depends on how it was obtained. They, um, uh, like, um, I don't use the post office, but um, it, sometimes they may hire a photographer for a project that may not be public domain. Um, I'll, use my, I'll use a real example, okay? My client's an architectural photographer. He's hired by a government agency. He's going to take photographs of this government building that they are building from scratch. And he takes progress photos for which his client is the contractor. The contractor is paying him for progress photos. He is not hired by the government. Okay? So he's taking progress photos and his client only has the right to use them to advertise their construction company. So now he has a government building. He's got photographs of it before it, might, it was born. And it might be on a government site, too. It may wind up on a government site because maybe my client doesn't care that it's on a wink, wink government site. But if you want to use it, or the town uh, chamber of commerce wants to use it, that says, come visit our new uh, post office or our new jail, they'd have to pay, they would have to pay him for a license. So the answer to your question is 95% of the time, yes, but not always. Yeah. That's that's about right, 95. So um, I'm not going to continue on the registration. We've done that in other things, and that'll eat up all the rest of the time on registration. We've done it many times. The rest of it's fairly standard. And, and uh, Takes five minutes after this? Well, it takes longer to explain. Once you, and the first time you do it, unlike what Ed said, the first time you, you do it, it might take you 45 minutes or something to do the whole thing. Once you do it once, you can zip through it like this, and you can create a template, which makes it real easy to do. So yes, registering your work, 
work is super fast usually, um, but the first time you do it, you're going to need some instructions or, or what do I do on this page. Once you know, it's real easy to do. And as we're going to get into in a few minutes, this is the only registration that counts. Registering with a company, no matter what they tell you, registering with a company located in the United States or in Europe means zero, and nada, we're gonna, nothing. We're going we're gonna to go over some examples of that, but you, we'll say this one more time because it's critical on registration, and the reason registration is so important. You cannot sue someone without a federal copyright office registration. The court will not accept your case. They will throw it out. The other side just has to say no registration and that's the end of it. It has to be in federal court. As we say, it's the key to the courthouse. So the other side, and a lot of lawyers know this, they tell their clients, if you've infringed and you get a letter from a photographer, probably ignore it until and unless you see that there's a registration and a registration number. That's what and, I do when and I represent the bad guy. Very simple. Yeah. No registration, there's no case. There's no case, and there's nothing you can do. You can't shame him into it. You can't make him feel guilty. It's a business, and I'll just say, we don't have to do anything. So where I got this was that link that I showed you earlier where I said there's a template that they want you to fill out the names. This is uh, where it is. If you click on it, you will get this. And uh, this one is for published images. The only difference between published and unpublished is this column that says required month and year of the publication for each image. If you're doing um, unpublished, this is the template. It's just missing that one column. So, How do you get the template? Um, it was way back when, when it was a link that they showed you on one of the pages. Let me go back real quick just to show you so there's no um, confusion, and I'll just jump back and forth. Again, this is more, this is more complicated to explain than it is to do. Yeah. Um, is it here? No. Hang on one second. Ah, here it is. It's, I'm going to show you the, the before and after. When you're on, on this screen for the type of group and you click on published or unpublished, and let's say we go to unpublished, at the bottom there'll be a link here that says, you know, this is what's required. You need a sequentially numbered list of photos, blah, blah, blah. Guidance for the numbered list can be found on the copyright.gov website at this link. And you click on this link, and when you click on that link, it will take you to this template. And it's just um, an Excel spreadsheet. That's all it is. But you have to fill this out and send it in with the registration now. That's a new requirement. Now, when you fill out, it's, there's certain things that are required when they're in red. Uh, this list, you have to insert the case number. The case number happens when you start a case. So th that'll be on the top of all the registration forms. That number is, is everywhere when you're filling this out. You fill in your case number, very easy. The other thing required is the title of the photograph. That could be, it can be photo one or photo two. I wouldn't recommend it. I would do something descriptive, something simple. And I wouldn't use the, um, what the camera names it. Um, so let's say I'm filling this out as Paris one, Paris two, New York City one, two, George one, two, three, from the airplane, you know, for 2018-01, whatever you want to name that file. When you fill this column out, this column automatically gets filled out with a comma after it. So you can grab this entire column and put it into that box that I told you you didn't have to fill out. Now, remember, if you are registering a limited amount of money, a limited amount of money, that'd be all right. Uh, obviously, my wife is on my mind. If you are <laughs> registering a limited amount of photographs, then you want a really good description. So again, let's using Bill Epperidge, who was a client uh, of mine who passed away, a very famous photo of Bobby Kennedy after he was assassinated, dying in the dishwasher's arms. And there are, let's say, seven shots that, quote, matter. Well, if Bill were to be registering those images today, were it 
to be, each one of those images would be meticulously described because there are seven obviously profoundly interesting uh, and noteworthy images. Now, let's switch and let's say you're doing a tabletop ad for Mikasa, okay? And you have a, a woman handling Mikasa dishes and there's only 10 images. You want brunette with teacup, blonde with 10 inch dish, tall man with um, serving gravy boat, whatever, if it's a small amount of images, because that way if there's ever a claim that the photograph that you registered is not the photograph that's been infringed, which by the way we get all the time, that registration and that description gives you the presumption, a legal presumption that you're correct. What does that mean in English? It means the other side has to show in court that you're wrong. You are presumed to be right. They have to prove that you're wrong. So you've shifted this big legal burden onto them and made their life more difficult. And yours infinitely easier. And that's a misconception a lot of people have. And a lot of the sites that we're going to go over scare you into thinking that you have to defend yourself on certain things. You don't. The people you're suing have to come up with those answers. Not you, if your image is registered. So um, let me continue with this. The other requirement is, along with the title of the photograph, the file name of the photograph. I like things simple. It's the exact same for me. So I will copy this and paste it here. I'm not going to enter it twice. So um, these are required, but the title of the photograph can be the same as the file name. Maybe the file name is, you know, uh, XYZ12, but you're naming it a Flight of the Dawn or something, you know. I don't do that. I, I'm just doing the same file name and the same photo name. Uh, on you could call it if you're doing if you're selling fine art. You can call it whatever you want. Okay, if it's registered under X Y Z one twenty seven and it's on the wall there and that's the image, you can call it what? What did you say? Flight of the Dawn or whatever, um, and it's still X Y Z one twenty seven. Doesn't matter. Yeah. So that's the new changes in registration. And we can't emphasize enough to register your images. And, uh -huh. and the people who, who are infringed and call us, and, and the first question, either me or Ed, if, if somebody's calling me instead of a lawyer, which you should call a lawyer, if you call Ed or you call another lawyer, the very first question is always, is it registered? It doesn't mean, I hate the double negative, believe it or not, it doesn't mean that if it's not registered, it's not worthwhile. If you go on our blog, you'll see the case of Andrew Paul Leonard, who's a client of mine, but this particular case was handled by one of his other uh, attorneys, unfortunately, in another state. He won over $2 million. Wasn't registered. He registered it after it was infringed and years after he created it. There were actual damages of $2 million. Certain photographers, some of whom I've represented or represent now or have never represented, like I represented Mr. Avedon. Mr. Avedon, while he registered everything, it wouldn't matter because he got paid so much. Yeah, Richard Avedon, not Richard, George or Fred right, Avedon. Richard Avedon. He got paid so much in the 60s and 70s that if he didn't register the image and had to register it now, the case would be worth millions of dollars anyhow. It wouldn't matter. But people like that, composed maybe one one hundredth of the top one percent of photographers. Yeah, the part that Ed isn't telling you is that if if it's not registered before the infringement, there's a lot of cases where it's going to cost you more to sue than you're going to collect. But if it's registered before the infringement, it's a completely different ballgame. But you can't make that decision mm -hmm. until you have spoken with an attorney, not one of these services that we're going to get to, with an attorney who's experienced in these matters and actually goes to court in the area where you live. If you uh, are a photographer in Fresno, you want to see an intellectual property attorney who goes to court in Fresno or LA or Chicago, wherever, you, wherever it may be. The fact that it has not been registered does not mean you don't have a case. You can register it. If they've used it on a clairol box and it's all over the world, and you have to register it well after the fact, believe me, I'll take the case. 
And any attorney who knows the business is going to take the case. And, and one of the things I'd said, we, we do have on our blog about hiring a lawyer, and we, we talk a lot about that. It's more than one article on hiring lawyers. And, and one of the things is you want a lawyer uh, locally who's dealt in court on these types of issues. A lot of guys are saying, well, I have a lawyer. I have my, my cousin's uh, sister is just graduated. You really need to get somebody who is experienced in this. And if you're researching a lawyer, find one who's done these types of cases in your area because they're going to be in front of those judges. And I'll tell you, Ed goes in front of a judge here in New York. They know him. Uh, I, I mean, how often do you get in front of a judge you haven't seen before? Well, I've had, I've had judges say to the other side, and magistrate judges say to the other side, look, I know Mr. Greenberg for years, and he's, I find him very credible, so if you have a problem with me handling the case, you better tell me now. All well, right? So if the judges know that the attorney is a troll, as yeah. one of the attorneys has been recently named Which we're going to go over here. Um, the judge is... I don't know if you want to call it bias, but the judge is going to know that this is someone who doesn't know what they're talking about. A quick, quick anecdote. I present a, uh, at a uh, conference with a judge, and I present to the judge what the facts are, and the other attorney says, well, in effect, that's not so. And the judge looks at him and says, and you're basing that on what? And he says, on my experience in this courthouse. Well, I had a printout. He had exactly one case in the Southern District of New York, Federal Court, Manhattan, one case 20 years ago was a contract case. And I put that in front of the judge and I said, this is how many times this attorney has been in this court. He says, Mr. Greenberg, I could tell you didn't even have to show it to me. So, yeah. It's local. You want somebody local? Now, I do a lot of cases in Florida for various reasons. I do a lot of cases in L.A. But... If I have well, a case... Well, you, you do cases in Florida because you're Jewish and it's the law. That's you have right, to move law. down there. Right. <laughs> My wife makes me. <laughs> a lot of it has to do, by the way, with... And this, I don't want to go off topic. But a lot of it has to do with the fact that we 20, are. 25 years ago, photographers, to make a living, basically had to be in New York. They've left New York. They're making a living all over the country. Uh, whether it's Florida, Austin, Asheville. My clients now are predominantly not in New York City. They're everywhere. But it, this isn't an ad for Ed. We, what we're trying to say is hire a Local. lawyer locally and do some research to make sure that they know this type of law. Otherwise, you're paying for their education. In the book and in our blog articles, it tells you how to hire a lawyer in Dubuque, if you live in Dubuque. If you live out away from some of the larger cities, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for you to get an intellectual property lawyer who knows photography. The nature of the business is that it's pretty well centered in certain cities. And the way to do that real quick, and again, we go into it in detail in the book and on the blogs, is not to call the Bar Association. Because the Bar Association is going to give you the name of an attorney who needs work. Yeah. So you want to call if you live in a small town and you have a family attorney, uh, maybe she's done your closing, she may know somebody. If she doesn't know somebody, she can get a referral. And then, if you can't get a referral, you call the local or the closest law school. And you get to the professor who teaches copyright law and ask that professor if he or she practices in the area or knows someone who does. If you get really lucky and you have a really interesting case, you may have a professor and 30 or 40 uh, slave, slave law students, which is how Mr. Dershowitz made his name, by having a staff of 40 or 50. I'd be brilliant, too, if I had 50. OK, you're, so you're starting to go further apart. Let's, go, come on, Ed, go bring it back. Go and get bring that professor to give you a name of somebody local who actually goes to court. And this is why lawyers get paid by the word and by the hour. So, so let's get into a couple myths and urban legends. This is part, we, we've gone over like 10 of these in a lot of our presentations and in our book. I'm not going to go over them all now, but like vampires, there is one that just will not die, that seems to just keep reliving and reliving. And now, especially in the digital age, it's, it's regurgitated again in many, many different ways. And that's the poor man's copyright. 
And that's because we were talking earlier about the US Post Office. This is about taking your image, a print obviously, putting it in an envelope, sealing the envelope, and mailing it to yourself through the US Post Office like that did something. All that proved is that you mailed yourself something. Um, legally, it's almost no re relevance whatsoever. It has no relevance at all, and I hate even discussing it because the repetition gives it credibility. I just brought a magazine for Jack on it for a completely different topic, and there's an article here about the Flat Earth Society, which now has, this is a well, business wait a minute, magazine. Wait a minute. Anybody in the audience a member of the Flat Earth Society before we do, okay, just, right. just wanted to check. This is, <laughs> this is an article on the Flat Earth Society from a perfectly legitimate business magazine. And the Flat Earth Society now has 50,000 paying members, and they include their biggest proponents are a comedian, Teela Tequila, and NBA player Kyrie Irving, and NFL very average wide receiver Sammy Watkins. <laughs> so what we get to when we get to these search firms, okay, and they're going to be telling you what the law is, they're not lawyers any more than these people are scientists. But 50,000 people are paying dues. That means that some percentage of the population of hip, sophisticated Americans and Brits believe it. And yeah, some of these search firms are counting on you to do no critical thinking and to believe the nonsense that they tell you and that we're going to show. So some of them, and one of them that Jack's going to get to, refers to this phrase. It doesn't exist. It's meaningless. Yep. But they know that some people think it does. So you know it's a what? Sales I, never, point. I never thought about this, but maybe we should start a round world um, association. I mean, that's right. And, right. And we'll get members. Right. How many do we need? I mean, at, at, at like two bucks each. That's yeah. uh, not bad. So anyway, the new thing on, on this myth these days is blockchain. Um, and blockchain, by the way, is wonderful technology. Um, it's very innovative. It's very good. It doesn't work for registration. And it's also, these days, still a bit cumbersome for what people are trying to tout it for. Now, I'm hoping that, that future versions of this, and, and as technology improves and as our computers improve, that maybe this can be utilized for a lot of different things, but not the way it's being advertised and presented to photographers today. And, and let's go into it. Now, this is one that I found. This, this I call old school. Um, uh. This is uh, electronic. Electronic depository stems from the concept of a poor man's copyright. Uh, one of our readers sent this in to me, and, and I had to laugh because we always saying this is something that just doesn't mean anything. He laughs, but this is why I can't buy my wife nice things. This is so dumb and stupid. I know you guys can't read at the bottom. It says benefits of electronic copyright depository, which is a made-up phrase. Time and date stamp, and then it says, secure legal proof that your works were created before any infringing copies. The depository marks the file is uploaded, when the file is uploaded. To maintain accurate dates and times of creation, you must upload your files in a timely manner after creation. This is garbage. This is bunk. And, and the reason he's saying that is if you register your images, one of the things about registering your images legally is something known as prima facie evidence. That means that proves that that's your image, that's when it was registered, and you're the owner. They have to prove otherwise, it's not you. It's accepted in court that this is the facts. So, so let's take this out of the photography realm. Who owns a car? Anybody own a car? You own a car? <laughs> Where do you live? In Manhattan, he's saying. Do you have the they car, can't hear this. Do you, do you have the car registered with the state of New York Department of Motor Vehicles? Yes. Okay. If you register it with me, or you register with Jack, or you register with this company, will you get insurance? No. Your car won't be registered. You have to go to the state. You can't go anywhere else. It's the exact same thing. Keep 
with copyright, with photos. If you own a boat and you register it, you must register it with the state that you live in. Whatever administrative agency takes care of it in North Carolina, Florida, or, or Illinois. Same thing with an automobile. If you don't register your photograph with the United States Government Copyright Office, any other, quote, so-called registration is garbage. Now, it says, legal proof that your works were created before any infringing copies. Really? So I steal, literally steal one of Jack's photos before he has a chance to register it. He doesn't even know I stole it. This is a real case. Assistant steals photo from photographer and registers it. Photographer doesn't know for three years until photographer sees it in all these magazines. Well, if I use this company, do I have proof that it wasn't stolen? No. But Ed, it has the American flag. It has there. the American flag there. If I, if, if I steal it, or if I've copied it, or if I've infringed it, am I going to tell one of these private companies, hey, this is a photo that I saw my pal Vinny take. It's great. Uh, you register it in your name. It's not proof. It's like me telling you I play right field for the Mets. To make it true? They could probably use you, but, but anyway. But they think photographers read this and it looks official, and you know what? Photographers believe it. And it gets worse. Let's go on to a couple other sites. So this is this I call old school because they're talking about still mailing something. The new school, and there's a bunch of sites, we're gonna go over a couple of them. One is Copy Track. And by the way, all these sites seem to be based in Europe specifically Germany. Why, I don't know. But I we've do. run across about half a dozen of these sites, and they're all based in Germany. Because you can't go after them in Germany. Because if they screw up, it's too expensive for you to sue them in Germany. Right there, see it says, I don't know if you, if you guys uh, and people looking at home, it says, proof of ownership of digital content. No, it's not. Not, not here in the United no, States. No, it's not. But let me, let me continue on this. This is, you wanted, this is one of the pages on here. Uh, uh, copyright uh, existing businesses with extreme gross. And I'm going to move up a little closer so you can read it, Ed. There you go. In an extremely short time, they are telling you that they started in Berlin. They have a, quote, presence in New York and, Tur and Tokyo, which in legalese means we're not doing business there. You can't sue us there. There's legalese in there. And that, in effect, we've gotten all these clients. Now, this is a common con man trick that goes back not hundreds but thousands of years. If you the person who made the most money with an invention two years ago, three years ago, had the most brilliant invention. Next time you go to a hotel, look on the door in the bathroom, and it's going to talk to you. It's going to say something about the towels. And it's going to say something about the environment and the towels, about washing the towels. So this gentleman came up with an idea for a major hotel chain, very, very successful. Instead of saying, if you care about the environment, you know, we'll, we'll wash your towels every other day. No. He changed the sign. 99.2% of the guests in this hotel request that their towels be washed every other day to help save the environment. But if you want them washed every day, just let us know. What does that do? Makes everybody follow the leader. So that by telling you that they have all these clients with no proof, photographers who are like sheep follow along. Everybody's doing it. And if Start a line in New York and people get on it. I got another screen up there for you for a minute. OK. It says, will the copyright register work? And it has new, our new platform. And there are five layers. And it's got a really cool looking graph. All of you are visual people, right? You don't really like to read, especially male photographers don't like to read. They don't. I've been interviewed by three shrinks over the years for study. Male photographers don't like to read. So this is a really good looking flow chart. It's garbage. Mm. It's crap. It means nothing. It looks good. So it says, why the world needs an open copyright register. Images used without valid license, 85%. Says who? It's nonsense. It's a made up number. It's I'm like me telling you I just won 157,000 in Vegas. How would you know? 
This is a made up number. No one could possibly know this. If that were an accurate number, I would be wealthy beyond belief, retired and on my 300 foot boat. Then it says rate of image uploads per year, 33%. What does that mean? Uh, anybody who has an image has uploaded it somewhere, sometime, right? Mm -hmm. What if you, what if you, what if your client who's paying you uploaded your image? Do you care? Well, this is still on their site. Um, they tell you copyright made simple, the easy way to protect your images free forever. Uh, perfect for photographers. And this is some of the pages continuing though, like how to upload your images. Register your copyright. This is not a registration. But what I really love about this is just to make it official, they include the Copyright Office seal. I don't think the Copyright Office would really be um, too thrilled about that. Is this deceptive? Now, I'm an attorney. I know how they're phrasing this. It's deceptive. They're not saying, you need to register your copyright, and then we will do this, that, or the other thing. What they want to do is they want you to register with them and then make as many quickie settlements as possible. Registering with them has zero legal effect. If you don't register with the United States Copyright Office, any so-called registration that you make is worthless, proves nothing, is not effective. Um, yeah, it's And it also says said. upload images to your private copyright vault from your computer phone or integrations like Instagram and then is it on the next slide? Um, probably yes it is. Uh, you here they, it's they will let you register if you click on here um, for $35 meaning an image. only registering a single image at a time <laughs> not a group plus the other part that will drive us absolutely crazy is if they register it you don't know how they're registering it. And we've seen companies, there was a famous case of Getty, was mass registering a lot of photographers together, and a photographer had a case, and he tried to use that registration, and it was done so poorly, it was thrown out of court. Thousands and thousands of registrations registered by Corbis were tossed as filed improperly. Um, they would like you to pay $35 an image when you can pay $55 for 75 images and you are 750 sorry and now you're going to trust them these people who don't have offices in the United States are not lawyers they're not paralegals you don't know who they are this is like picking a surgeon out of the yellow pages. Yeah, and we're getting And he's from Germany. I'm trying to hook up to get some of this stuff um, and there is a question from somebody that I'll talk to about in a little bit about uh, Richard Prince, which we've gone into detail on our a last webinar. Times. We're not going to get into that right away, but we, we do have a shout out from William King, who's vacationing in Mike, Mykonos in uh, Greece. Hi, Bill. <laughs> Gee, I hope it's really warm and nice. <laughs> <laughs> not me. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think Ed's gone over this uh, pretty much in detail. It's, this just drives me nuts. The next one is monitoring your work. They give you, we give you a copyright certificate as proof which can help you protect against copyright infringement. Anybody uh, who speak English know what that means? Because it means nothing. nothing. It's a piece of paper. It means nothing. It's a piece of paper that says you registered with them. Yeah. And if Jack took the photo, Jack is going to say, I don't care if it says you're the Messiah. That's my photo. Here's the model, and he brings out the model. And this is who I shot it for, and here's my paid invoice. And here's my, most important, copyright registration. This is garbage. So um, that's pretty much a lot of these, these uh, search and um, search and sue firms. Uh, and I think Ed's gone over some of this. We do have a, a blog piece on our blog, The Copyright Zone, um, called Fool's Gold, part one, that just went up on Monday. Um, and it covers not any one of these specific things, but generically what the issue is with all of these types of search and, uh, search and sue firms. And there are issues such as 
they don't know what it's worth. They are what we call pioneers. They're early settlers. Whatever is offered in settlements, they take, because if they get 100 of these and settle for two or 3,000, it's more money for them than an individual case that might, cost, that might be worth $50,000 um, or $60,000 or $70,000, but it might take four, five, six, eight months um, to negotiate and go through, and they don't want to spend that kind of time on it. This is an analogy that is perfect. It works. If you can't see a doctor and it's an emergency situation, you might not mind seeing a physician's assistant or a registered nurse or a practical nurse or even an orderly. Here, these people have no legal training. So it's as if you went to your next door neighbor who happens to be a plumber and say, look, this is turning green. What do you think I should do? How do you want to treat this? These are not people who even claim to have any legal training. Go on the sites yourselves. See if there are any attorneys named. See if they have won any cases. See if they are licensed to do business in the state of New York. See if they have an office in California, New York, Illinois, Texas, Florida, where if something happens, you can sue them. They're doing business from abroad to insulate themselves. Now, what's the attraction? Photographers are risk averse. You hate controversy. You hate adversarial proceedings. You don't like fighting. You don't like, uh, um, you know, attorneys, which is makes perfect sense that you don't like attorneys. Yep. So what they're selling you, what the con is, we will take care of everything for you. Um, That's the con, and it's subtle. And it works, and it will cost you a fortune. Well, we have a couple of questions. I'm, I've been having problems with this. By the way, we're, we're on a, a time delay, which they, they know you, so that's pretty good. No. Um, uh, somebody asks, um, uh, do you have new information on the new copyright forms? Yeah, we just showed we just it. just did it. Um, also, uh, Sharon in Israel is saying it's 103 degrees in Tel Aviv, and he just wanted to let you know. Thanks you a want lot. To know how the weather appreciate is. that. He said, come on down. I appreciate that. Um, and if anybody has any other questions, I've been, I, I must have I missed a couple, um, but do ask him or ask him again, please, because we had a, a connection problem a little earlier. Um, one of the other... Um, we can pick this up right here, just number one, which is on the blog. There are no statistics anywhere, and they are impossible to ascertain how many copyright claims there are in any year or any given year. Most claims do not go uh, most claims are not filed in any court, ever. Most are resolved. Mediation? No, don't say mediation. That's Sorry. different. We can get into federal mediation. You should look up on our blog arbitration, which you cannot uh, involve yourself with, but I'll talk to you afterwards about okay. that. Yeah, we're not fans the, of arbitration. Nobody, nobody could know how many copyright claims there are in a given year and nobody could know how they've been resolved in a given year. Those numbers are unascertainable. It would be as if I were able to tell you the number of Catholics who went to confession in 2017, how often they went, and what their sins were. Those figures are not ascertainable. Over 40 years, I've handled thousands of claims. I don't even know how many thousands of claims. There are several hundred which were filed lawsuits. You could look up and you could see that I, I sued NBC or CBS or Viacom, and you can see who sued them, uh, and Corbis and so on. Maybe the decisions in four of those cases, three of those cases that were final decisions are public knowledge. Now, for every one of those cases, our office has 100 cases that were resolved without anybody filing a lawsuit. I can't tell you what happened because there's a confidentiality agreement. Okay, I'm not Stormy Daniels. I have a license to protect. The other attorney has a license to protect. And the parties who may have paid or just stopped using a picture are not allowed 
to discuss it. So if you see a photographer's attorney say, we successfully settled, which is one of my favorites, because where there's, a, there's an attorney who has on his website, successfully settled the case A versus B. Well, I represented A. His client paid $100,000, and my client would have taken 50. So he thinks he successfully settled it. You can't successfully settle anything. But when you see websites that say, we do more of this than anybody, we filed more cases than anybody, that is advertising. Okay. It's BS. It's fake. Well, let's get to another. Um, uh, I got two more columns just to highlight from the blog. And this one was one we did recently, too. What lawyer ads can be misleading. Um, believe it or not. Lawyers lie, on, lawyers lie on their websites just like health food and fake uh, snake oil salesmen do. There are, there are occasionally uh, attorneys who are called to task for it. Very, very rarely. There are a lot of starving lawyers out there who can't make a living. This area of copyright infringement and pursuing the infringements has, is, is lucrative if the photographers, especially I should say, when the photographers have filed their registration and they have an attorney who knows what he or she is doing. So there's a spot there for attorneys who can't make a living, failed photographers who went to law school, and there are lots of them. Yeah, beware of photographers slash lawyers, um, I, I can tell you. Uh, one other one that we really liked, it was, it was about something that happened recently. Ed talked about it very briefly. Uh, and we titled I love the title, Trolls Who Live Under Bridges Upset by Judges' Comparison. He called a, a lawyer a copyright troll. And, and why did he do that? The Ed? lawyer had filed 600 cases in the last two or three years. 500 cases. 500, sorry. Well, it's actually, I'm right, it's closer to 600. They said 500, it's closer to 600. But what's 100 between friends? And this judge, um, who I have been before, who is no dope, federal court judges are very rarely uh, less than brilliant, uh, truly. This was her 16th case with this guy. It's not possible. For any case with the judge or case with this judge, judge, just that one judge, just this one judge. This guy and files files a lot. Doesn't mean that they go on to trial, but he's constantly filing cases in court. And what he's doing, and, and Ed's going to get to, I'll tell you, is he's using that as leverage to negotiate. What he's supposed to be doing is negotiating first, talking with the other party to see if they can resolve it. He's in a rush to make as much money as he can quickly. So what he's doing is he's filing cases, then contacting people to um, uh, um, see if he can get a quick settlement. And once in a while they go, take us to court. And they go to court. And just in this one judge in this one court, in and there's more judges, He's been in front of this judge 16 times with cases. And the judge sees what the cases are about. And he's a bit upset because, as Ed said, she, he's no dummy. The judge has seen his conduct in several cases. And she's labeled him a troll. And a copyright troll Which is, is really someone, unusual for a judge to do. It's extremely unusual to uh, term an attorney a troll. A troll, whether it's a patent troll or a copyright troll, is someone who starts cases in the hopes that someone's going to settle because the uh, expense of defending is too high. But if you register your image and you're entitled to legal fees if you prevail, and you filed it in federal court where you must in copyright law, the lawyer has an obligation that before filing suit, he or she perform due diligence. Make sure that there are in some documents which take the other side off the hook. Make sure that you're in the right courthouse. Contact the other side and let them know. Take it down. Perhaps you don't know this is going on. Now, there are certain emergencies, and in 40 years I've had about a dozen, where you go to court right away. There's a child on a billboard who's portrayed as a methamphetamine addict. You go to court right away. But those are less than a quarter of 1%. 
you have an obligation. If I don't fulfill that obligation, or if any attorney doesn't fulfill that obligation, to discuss with the other side a possible resolution or see if they're off the hook. Maybe they have a. Maybe they got a fake license from Getty or Corbis. Maybe they acted in good faith. Usually not. I have an obligation. Every attorney has an obligation to do that. If I don't do that. I can get fined, I can get sanctioned, I can get suspended. He got fined $10,000 and then they reduced it to $2,000. It is impossible, impossible for any small or medium or large law firm to have 500 cases on the docket filed within two years, 500 unrelated cases, okay? and have done the due diligence that any attorney does before filing a case. It's impossible. And the judge calls and describes a troll and calls him a troll and says, in common parlance, they are more focused on the business of litigation than on selling a product or service or licensing their copyrights to third parties uh, or ser uh, to to third parties to sell a product or service. A copyright troll plays a numbers game in which it targets hundreds of thousands of defendants seeking quick settlements priced just low enough that it is less expensive for the defendant to pay the troll rather than to defend the case. I don't take cases like that. Reputable attorneys don't take cases like that. Have I had important clients who say, look, this is a small case, can I bother you with it? Would I write a letter on a small case? Sure. That doesn't mean I'm going to put the case into suit. Sometimes the other side says, gosh, golly gee, our bad. How much, how much money will you take? We, we took it down, our bad. Here's a check. Okay? Happens all the time. You don't run. If you see a lawyer who says, I filed a zillion cases, go to another site. Because he shouldn't be filing a zillion cases. He should be far more selective. He perhaps doesn't know how to settle cases. Or he or she perhaps doesn't want to settle cases. Or she, he or she perhaps, and this is very common in this field, doesn't know what they're worth. I get lawyers call me because I serve as an expert witness for other lawyers who call me up and say they want to pay me, but I don't know how much to ask. What should I ask for? They don't know. It's... Um there's just so many stories about this, and my mind keeps going through a lot of different things that, that you tell me about um, about these types of lawyers and the stuff that they're looking for. Um, uh, and I lost track completely. I'm trying to, to get the questions. We're still having some. If, if any of you drive, especially the interstates, and you see the PI lawyers, you know, I just drove back from Florida, and boy, my arm's tired. And you know, you see, you there's, there's a personal injury lawyer in northern Florida. And he's got, he's Dan whatever. And you see these signs. Dan got me 550000 Dan got me $380,000. The sites that are going after photographers are worse. Because in that case, Dan and most of those PI attorneys, they're legitimate PI attorneys. They're just trying to get business. But... 90% of them actually know what they're doing. The, the one I really like in the ads, are the, the, there's a lawyer who actually said, um, these are the cases I've been involved with, you know, like some big name cases. What they didn't tell you is they lost the case. They didn't win. Yes, they, they had um, um, a client in the case that they were defending or whatnot, but the client ended up paying a lot of money. But you look in the advertising and you say, oh, these are some of the cases we've done. You have to find out what happened with the case. Because I, I thought that was real tricky when I well, saw that. Well, there, there's another common one, and this uh, appears more often than uh, most people realize. Uh, we do a lot of cases where reps are stealing from photographers. And mm -hmm. oftentimes, a rep will license out a photograph without the photographer's knowledge. The client uses it. The photographer never gets paid. Is that a copyright infringement or is that a contract action? Well, it's a contract action. It may be a fraud action. The rep might go to jail. Could be criminal. You think that, I, do you think I, these services know the difference? No. 
Somebody uh, online was asking, they're based in Canada, what should they do about registration? See a Canadian lawyer. Well, one, see a Canadian see? lawyer, but you do not have to be a U.S. citizen or a U.S. resident to register with the U.S. Copyright Office here in the U.S. The reason you want to do that is even though you're not a U.S. citizen or resident, if your work is being used in the United States, you can sue. And there's an advantage uh, in some cases for you to sue here in the United States instead of a place like Canada. And we have done that just in the last year for people who are residents of Ireland, Germany, Belgium, France. They register everything in the United States because they know that if there's an infringement in the United States, unless they register it, it's not going to be worth pursuing. I had a student of mine from SVA, School of Visual Arts, uh, based in the Middle East, and they had a picture that was used by a Korean company, let's say um, Samsung. Uh, Samsung used it here in the United States. It was a lot easier to sue here than anywhere else. So it, that's the reason you would register here in the United States as a non-citizen or, and or a non-resident. There's no problem registering your work that way. Um, I'm going to move on a little bit to this because it's been up for a while. This is from Petapixel. Um, and it was an article about Stranger Things used this person's storm cloud without permission. And what a lot of the people in the comments were saying, and, and it was just driving me nuts, is you can't copyright nature. You can't. You cannot copyright a particular view, uh, like one of the Ansel Adams view. Let's say you went and photographed um, um, Moonrise over Hernandez, and you went to Hernandez, you knew the exact time it happened, and you redid it. You can do that. He doesn't own that view. He owns what's known as his expression his photograph of that view. So one of the arguments by um, um, Stranger Things and what they did was that, um, well, you can't, it's not a copyrightable image, you copyrighted nature. He didn't. He copyrighted a very specific photograph of a very specific storm. And that photograph itself is protected. And what they did to it, and people online were saying, well, they changed it and they did this and that. Yeah, they did. That's known as a derivative. If you followed our other lectures, you know that you have something known as a bundle of rights. And one of the rights legally in your bundle of rights is the right of derivatives. So as you were saying before about taking a picture of a, a, a artwork on a wall like graffiti, well that artwork is owned by somebody else. You can't take a picture of it and register that copyright of your photograph because you don't own that image, that photograph. But in this case, he doesn't own every image of a storm or this particular storm type, but he owns his particular specific image of that storm cloud. And that's what they use, because when you looked at the little tiny things here, they were exactly from his photograph. And they can alter part of it, and they can stretch it and do other things, but they've obviously used their photograph. Um, I hope he has a very good lawyer, because I think he has a very, very good case. And I hope he registered the image beforehand. Um, Jack, I, when, you, when you're ready, I have a couple questions. We have some questions that somebody's giving me because I'm running into some technical issues here. What's the question from, from the from internet? <laughs> Uh, Jonathan asks, I took some pictures on film 40 years ago as an amateur photographer. While still naive about copyright, I shared the photos with two individuals on the internet. Is it too late to register the photos? No. Yeah, the, the question is he took images 40 years ago on film, obviously, because there was no digital then, and he shared it with two individuals. Can he still register the image? Yes, there, you can register images um, that weren't published from 40 years ago. Now, if it was published 40 years ago, um, and we've had this with, with one of Ed's clients that I've helped with too, who had things... Um, published in the 60s, and he's trying to register them now, and we're facing some different copyright laws from then that still apply because they were published then. If they were not published then, 
and because uh, somebody else had this question, if he has images that weren't published, he can register them now as unpublished uh, with no problem because he's registering them today with today's laws. If they were created 40 years ago and they're registered and he registers them now, they're not presumed, the registration is not presumed to be 100% authentic in a court proceeding because he's taken more than five years to register them. But if he shot them and he created them, it's not a problem. The answer is, no matter how old the images are, within well, less than 75 years and in effect, um, yes, they can be registered now. There are people who have photographs, uh, periodically professional f f photographers, and I've had this occur with my clients minimum 25 times. Occasionally, you'll see in the newspaper lost photographs of fill in the blank, okay? Famous rock group, famous politician, Marilyn famous Monroe. whatever, Marilyn Monroe. Found, never been seen, found after 40 or 50 years. They haven't been lost, they've been put in a drawer and the photographer has been waiting for the right time to take them out. Or their outtakes from a photo session where they used one photo and now they have 200 other images from that session that are now extremely valuable. What about the, uh, the, the uh, Bert Stern ones where Mary. they, uh, Marilyn Monroe, where they X'd it out, you know, with the magic marker because they weren't going to use it, and now those images that were X'd out are worth a fortune. What, one of my clients photographed a famous rock group. It was going to be for a record album cover, and um, he forgot about it. They paid him to do the shoot, but they didn't use it for the cover. And I get a phone call that says, do you represent Joe Blow Photographer? And I said, yes, why? Well, uh, it was a typical New York, we're moving to Florida, we're clearing out the garage, my husband used to work for so-and-so, and he found this big box. And the box was of my client's images that were in consideration for this album cover. But they weren't used, and they weren't returned. We're talking about film strips and prints. My client didn't care because he got paid to do the shoot and he knew they weren't going to use them and essentially he forgot about it. Now, decades later, they're worth money because the entertainment group, who was big then, is still big. No one's ever seen them. One day they'll come out when my client deems them to come out and they'll be the lost pictures of fill in the blank. Let me move on to a couple other things. There is one question from the back um, that uh, about Richard Prince, which I'll try and get to at the end, but I will tell you, if you go to the previous B&H event space uh, Q&A that we did with Ed and mine, if you search for it, we go into deep detail about that. Richard Prince did not get away with doing stuff as people thought. The, the carry you case that everybody points to on that he quote won was settled between him and Patrick Carry because he was going to get killed for five images that went back to Judge Bates in lower court. Um, so there's a lot of misconceptions about Richard Prince and what he can and can't do. Um, he can't seal images. One of the reasons he's able to do what he does is people don't register their images and they don't sue him. If they did, it would be a different story. One of the reasons people steal a lot of our images is because the vast majority of us do not register our images and protect them and sue about it. And as a result, there's companies that do cost analysis. They will say, what will it cost us if we're sued for this or we are being sued, what are the possible damages? And they find out that it's more practical in, in a business sense, and I hate to say this. Actuaries. It, yeah, actuaries. That's similar. They, they will say that it's worth it to steal all these images and not pay for them and pay for the maybe two or three that we might have to settle in the course of a year that cost-wise will be further ahead. I, I, and they'll do it as a business decision. I'll, I'll get a letter from an attorney in Kansas City with a whole packet that asks me to review it and says, if we get caught, what's the downside? They haven't even been caught yet. Sometimes it happens when a company is sold to another company and they don't do what's called due diligence about what intellectual property they own. 
So if there's, let's say, a three-year license to use the image in the model, and company B sells to company A, company A doesn't bother to check whether they still have a license to use either the model's image or the photographer's image. By the way, the time frames may be different. They may have two years' rights to use the model and five years on the, from the photographer. And they'll call me up and they say, what's the worst case scenario? And I said, have you been contacted yet? And I said, no. And I'll look it over and I say, wait till you're contacted. Take it down, wait till you're contacted, and if they don't contact you within the next two, three years, you're home free. That, unfortunately, is the reality of what happens out there. But let me move on a little bit um, on one thing that I like. We, we do have an article on our blog called The Value of Watermarks. And I just want to go over very briefly about watermarks. I think there's a big confusion about it. Um, this was a picture I just took this past weekend. Um, yeah. I do this for, for a group called Collaborative Cats up in Ancrumdale, New York, where um, this little kitty's up for adoption. And, and I photograph a lot of these cats uh, for this woman there to help them get adopted. And they're just adorable. Now, what we, I don't do, uh, on, in her case, the pictures are just going up. But if I was using this image, the one thing I'm not going to do is this. <laughs> I'm not putting a big honking copyright thing over it. And it, it's ugly. It doesn't look good. It's distracting. Um, and why would I want to do that? And it's unnecessary. But what I will do is put in a very discreet watermark in the corner, and if you look at it, and I put it in and I fade it, I just want the notice there. I want it there for a couple reasons. One, so people know who shot it, to know that I do have a copyright notice, um, and if they remove it, it's an entirely different infraction. It's something I can sue with along with infringement. This is just an add-on. Let, let me explain that a bit. He doesn't have to put anything up. You don't have to put anything up. Right. It's Since Jimmy Carter was president, you don't have to put anything up. But if that watermark is removed, then it's evidence of a willful infringement. It's not a slam dunk, but it's very, very good evidence of a willful infringement. If you have a willful infringement of your timely registered image, your minimum award is $30,000. So if someone takes that out or removes the metadata, it's $30,000 willful and, look on the blog, Section 12, Federal Law, the mere removal of your metadata, you can collect on even if there's no copyright infringement. You can collect thousands of dollars without a copyright infringement. You have a question? How about if they crop it? Does How about if they, if they crop, crop it? it? That's a removal. All right. If they, they, they can't crop it. <laughs> um, and the other thing that I add to these days, because I'm reading the copyright compendium from the Copyright Office, where if you really want to get a headache or go to sleep really quickly, you can download what's called the Copyright Compendium. It's, it's I don't know how many thousands of pages, but it's all the rules and things that the Copyright Office follows. Um, and I will also put in, in capital letters, all rights reserved. Now, in South America, that is required as a copyright notice years ago that you had all rights reserved on it. I'm putting it on there to state basically that this is not intended to be reproduced. It's not intended for redistribution. I am retaining all rights to it. And what this is doing is it's saying that this is not a publication of this image if I'm putting it up online, that it's only being put up online to be viewed. Now, Ed and I are... Not in 100% agreement on this, but this is, this is my stance on this. In order to say that this is an unpublished image, I'm saying, here's my copyright notice with the words, all rights reserved. Now, not so that there's no confusion, let's say this um, I think you're out of frame there. Can you go oh. over here, please? OK. <laughs> let's say this image was being used to advertise Friskies. Friskies or their ad agency may not want Jack's name on there, they may not want the copyright, and they don't want all rights reserved for aesthetic or sales purposes. Right. Does that affect Jack's rights if he's registered the image? No. He no. doesn't need it there at all. Sometimes, and most of the time, I would say 90% of the time, photographers make the mistake of taking credit instead of getting paid. Try filling your gas tank with that. 
try uh, filling, uh, try paying your mortgage with that. And when you do something for credit in lieu of getting paid, again, 90 plus percent of the time, it's nuts. The example that I use to death that seems to be the only one that works is if you have young children who aren't diaper trained and you have one bathroom in the house and it's 3 a.m. and the toilet is clogged, try calling a plumber and say, listen, I don't intend to pay you, but if you come out here and unclog my toilet, I will tell all the neighbors on the block that you are the best plumber and see if the plumber gets out of bed. What can we tell you? So the, the point of this is I don't need a, a big honking copyright symbol in the middle. It's not going to stop anybody. It's, if I load something up on my Instagram feed, at Riznicki, um, you will see just my copyright notice very discreetly somewhere on there. Hopefully you can barely see it. I don't care. I just want it there for all these reasons. So anything goes up, bless you, has my um, um, copyright note. We have case after case after case where our clients can show down to the pixels that the image was ripped off. Most of the attorneys who defend infringers don't understand it, and then we send it to them, and it's in, on the blog. Look up watermarks, and as soon the as value they start, of watermarks. the value of wa watermarks, as soon as the infringer starts altering the image, you as the photographer, as the creator, are looking at potentially a very substantial recovery. Um, with that, we're we're down to uh, the last 15 minutes at the most. Um, uh, do we have more Go questions ahead. from... A question came in on Facebook. It says, can I scan old contact sheets and then register all at once each individual image on those sheets? Can they register a, um, uh, a contact sheet by photographing the contact sheet? The Copyright Office has, uh, and I knew somebody that just did this, it used to be common practice. Uh, I know somebody who just got rejected for that because they couldn't see enough of the image. My recommendation, instead of doing the whole contact sheet like that, is to photograph each image uh, with a macro lens, you know, or a simple lens, do each image individually on the on the um, uh, contact sheet and register those images. Otherwise, you need a high res image of that contact sheet so they could see each individual image uh, well enough. So my my suggestion is photograph each frame individually. Create a small JPEG because we always say that all you need to register your images is a small JPEG, six to eight hundred pixels on the longest side, seventy-two PPI, and a JPEG compression of five. All you need to do is be able to reproduce it in court to see that that is the image, and that's all you need to do to see the image. Can you repeat those parameters? The par I'll repeat them again. And, and this is why we're blue in the face, because I think we do this every time we talk. Um, 600 to 800 pixels on the longest side, which you can do easily set up a uh, action in Photoshop or in Lightroom to do. Um, and that's what I do, because for verticals or horizontals, I always put you know, 700, 750 uh, for the longest side. Um, 72 PPI, pixels per inch, is the resolution and I save it as a JPEG compression of five. It creates a very small file that I can easily upload. One other note, for because some of you obviously haven't registered, whatever you send to the Copyright Office to register, keep excellent records of what you sent in. I keep a file of everything I sent in exactly the way I sent it in with all the file names, with, with the folder name, which is the title of the collection, and then when I get my registration back, I add on the registration number. So I have all the images in more than one location on my computer. I have it in two locations at least. Um, every file I've sent in. And then I have a file folder of the registrations themselves, which is a paper form you get from Keep the copyright Keep paper office. records. Do not rely on electronic records. I could tell you 30 horror stories in, in I'm going to go in the back because I think, and then I'll come right back up to you. Uh, with the nice weather, I've been doing a lot of photography <laughs> down. What the nice weather? weather. <laughs> well, that's with nice. Week, so okay. A couple of weeks. In between raindrops, you've yeah. been taking pictures. In the lower east side, and occasionally you see aspiring models coming around. 
and I, there's a lot of great graffiti on the storefront gates. Okay, you're you're graffiti. you're shooting you're shooting on the streets, and, and, and I have to repeat yeah, for the audience, you, you're shooting on the Lower East Side, and you're shooting expiring models. You're shooting uh, Back, things on the side of a building. Or backdrops of a lot of graffiti. Backdrops of a lot of graffiti. And I'm noticing more and more that this might be an issue, if in case. Well, here's here's the story, and it's specific in in the compendium, the copyright compendium, and and it's hard to give you a definitive answer without seeing the image. But I'll tell you what the approach is: if it's used merely in the background, and it's not the major part of the image, it's incidental. It's it's being used in a utilitarian way, as they say, um, and you're not, you know, the the model isn't there going. You know, and it's not the major part of the image, you're okay, it's background. You don't have a problem with it. Great, and just today, someone took my image with the model, a model, in the backdrop, cropped out the model, and just put the photo of part of the mural pattern, which is very distinct, and then tagged my name as it being my image. So, so somebody had an image of you in a model with a background, they cropped you guys out and just showed the background? Right, and the pattern of the, the graffiti artist. The graffiti artist, that's, that belongs to the graffiti artist. Right. That, that's exactly what we're saying. That's just highlighting the graffiti. That's not incidental. Let, oh, now it's not. Let me give you, now it's not, yeah. In fact, let me give you three quick real life, and I'll change it a little bit. Number one, you ever watch King of Queens? Television show? Anybody watch King of Queens? Yeah, it's been gone for a while. And no, it's on repeats. It's on repeats every night. Well, his new show just in King got of canceled. Queens, in King of Queens, the wife's place of work, there's a very big mural of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, the woman who created that is my client. She gets paid. Every. Well, got paid every, for every episode that they used it in. That's the way it's supposed to. On the other hand, I have sued television shows who have used some of my client's artwork and altered it so that it became a focal point of a particular uh, backdrop or scene or scenario. Uh, also, <laughs> which, which this is a good background now for that story. Right. So you talk about shooting models on the street. It's a public record that I commenced the lawsuit. I cannot tell you how it was resolved. I represent a very well-known uh, model agency uh, in the area that you're talking about. When models came out, and I'm talking about world famous models, when they came out and they were wearing um, Prada. Prada, and they're walking down the street, photographers were taking pictures of them and using those models to sell those goods on consignment sites without the model's permission. Uh oh. So, Ed, and Ed's smiling, that should tell you enough Those right are my there. model cases, when, when images of models are used to promote or sell product, service, entity, charity, it doesn't matter. Those are my easiest cases, my best cases, my favorite cases, no stress cases. So if you're taking pictures of models coming out of the model agency, I've been there more than once, you cannot use those for the sale or promotion, uh, not commercial. Don't say commercial, because the word is not commercial. If he wanted to license his image to the Daily News, okay, or the New York Post, or the LA Times, that says, here's Big Shot Model who's in town from, you know, doing Dolce Cabana, that's fine. That's an editorial use. He doesn't have to have the model's consent for that. However, the same picture, which is a commercial use, and he brings it to Prada, and Prada says, "Here's Big Shot model with our Prada bag. Model needs to call me right away because model will win lots and lots of money." Because Prada has lots of money. Uh, your question? So my question is, I'm part of portfolio development. We had to publish your, books. You're, you're part of you're part of the portfolio development here at mm -hmm. B&H. And we had to publish books as part of our assignment. So you have to publish books as part of your assignment. Through Blurb, and it's up on Blurb. Through and Blurb, anybody right. Anybody can see my entire book on a preview. Can see uh, your entire book on a preview. I haven't, I haven't uh, registered those. And you haven't registered the images. 
I would suggest to register the images. So do I have to register it as published even though nobody has officially bought the book other than me? Why does buying mean anything? I don't know. You've, you've presented it for sale. Okay. That is considered published. The fact that you're unsuccessful selling it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's the fact right. that you've offered it for sale is specifically what it says in, in the uh, uh, compendium. It's offering it for sale or further distribution. Or should I take it down and then register it as unpublished? I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't answer that. Uh, you can talk to me afterwards because you don't want to talk about that in public. Yeah. If I write a book and I get a publisher and I get no advance and it goes into Barnes and Noble and it's on Amazon and I don't sell a copy, didn't I publish it? If the people have the good taste not to buy my book, it doesn't mean I didn't publish it. Here's something else I will tell you um, that happened to us. Um, we love our publisher. They've been great and wonderful. Um, um, we got in a thing in our contract where they wanted to register the book themselves at the copyright office. And we, we really held out wanting to keep it, and they were adamant. There was a lot of give and take in our contract, and that was something we decided we weren't going to, um, uh, that wasn't a sword we were going to die on. I knew how copyright works, and I know how it works with publishers, book publishers, magazines. I called about a month and a half after it was published and said, did you apply for the, for the copyright? The person who's in charge, they finally got me the person in charge, said, no, we haven't done it yet. We're really buried. We have a three-month window to register and be fully protected on a published work after publication. It, this is not unpublished. This is for published. If it's published, there's a three-month window that you can register after the publication. They give you a grace period for only published work. And I knew we wanted to publish within the window. And I asked the person, well, are you going to get to it? in the next week or two, and they said, I don't think so. Do you mind if I register it? And they said, no. So we registered it. If you're publishing with a publisher or someone with a magazine, do not trust them to register the work. I've heard from somebody just um, yesterday, actually, on the phone, uh, a photographer friend, who just found out that he thought some magazine that he was contributing to for years, a very high-end magazine, uh, was registering the copyrights, and they weren't. Why would they register his copyrights? He was assuming they did. Do not assume anybody else is going to, and do not allow anybody else to register your images. Do it yourself. If for some reason you get caught up like we did, where somebody else has contractually taken those rights to register it for whatever reason, follow up and make sure that it's being registered. My, I've told this story many times. I would not have believed it if anybody else had uh, told it to me. Those of us who are, uh, let's say, over 40 know the name of the author. That author was not my client. My client had some decent book sales and came to me with a case, and the book company had been purchased by one of the largest publishers in the way they still are, one of the largest publishers in the world. And his registrations were not made, even though the five books that they published of his, which had respectable sales, each had a copyright notice, none of the copyrights were filed. So my associate Tamara Fitzgerald and I are looking at each other, and she is infinitely uh, smarter uh, with uh, computer stuff and more patient than I. And she starts going through the copyright office, and one of the biggest authors of all time, top 10 selling author of all time, none of this author's books were registered. So we notified the publisher, a name you all know, pick the biggest, and said, do you know that none of the copyrights for your big shot author who sold 100 million books were never registered? And to make a uh, long story longer, the woman who was in charge of registering copyrights didn't register anybody's copyrights. <laughs> she went to work every day. She would read. She would drink. She would call her friends, stay on the phone. This is pre-internet, so she wasn't even, you know. And they found over 100 books that were never registered. Some of the big, biggest selling books of all time were registered 30 years, novels, you know, that have been turned in, one that was turned into a movie. 
and they turned it into a movie and didn't even check to see if it was registered. And there's a lot of stories that you don't hear of. Like, you know, every, it used to be for years, every year, and it's still done to a degree, uh, they showed the movie um, uh, with Jimmy life. Stewart. It's a wonderful life. And it's become such a wonderful Christmas story. In fact, some TV stations ran it all day long, back to back. The reason was it was out of copyright. They didn't have to pay anybody to show it. That's why they were showing it. Um, because they didn't keep up the registration because the rules were different back then. What happened eventually is the studio reacquired the copyright, which is a real technical legal thing uh, and some hoops they ran through, but they got it re-registered. And now you don't see it as much. You still see it, but not quite as often in those odd channels that used to run it all the time because now they have to pay for it. They keep looking for out of copyright movies that they could show without paying uh, a royalty on. With that, um, I think we have run out of time mm -hmm. yet again. We've wasted another two hours of these people's times. Um, we will be sticking around for the people that are here if you have any more questions, but um, uh, this is all that uh, B&H is going to allow us to prattle on. Uh, and we, we appreciate uh, use of the hall and use of the internet. Um, and coming out on a much. lousy day. Thank you.